Thank you very much for coming. Don't forget to sign in and pick up an evaluation. Later on, you can pick up the certificates for MCLE credits. Um, my professional name is Robert James Logan. My street name is Jimmy Logan. <laughs> but I'm not the same Jimmy Logan from Maravilla. That was another guy, and he died on a chain up north of the years ago. Uh, I was always getting hassled for this year. Um, what we're looking at is substance abuse as it occurs amongst our profession. Okay. And the, yeah, I still include myself. Uh, the, as a practical matter, um, you have about 10% of the population to 15% of the population in the United States that is addicted to or abuses alcohol and other drugs. Other drugs can be pharmaceuticals, the stuff you buy at CVS and Rite Aid, the stuff that uh, is prescribed by doctors for you, and then those illicit substances. And then we have a variety of other uh, over the, ta the table type of substances, such as alcohol and tobacco, but that's another issue. And don't get me started on medical marijuana. But um, what we look at, it's not uncommon. It's not pathological for us to use something to make ourselves feel better. Psychologically, when our brain is tweaking, we want to do, or when we're nervous about stuff, we want to take care of that issue. Uh, if it's emotional, we want to take care of that issue. If it's physical, we want to take care of that issue. And that all stems from who we are and what we are from the time we crawled out of the slime, right? Um, if you all go like this, where those two intersect is lizard brain city, okay? And that is exactly where those motivations come from, the fight or flight type of stuff, uh, the make another one of me, uh, eat before you're eaten. <laughs> and when your, your uh, physiological senses of pain, emotional, psychological, and physical are there. And so when we first crawled out of the slime and went around eating stuff, um, you know, when the guys got run out of the garden because of that snake or because they fell out of the trees, uh, they'd be walking by figuring out what we're going to eat now. And they'd walk by and somebody said, oh, look, eat it, and then fall over dead. And then everybody would say, and the elders would say, don't eat that. <laughs> but we discovered things that change the way we feel. Uh, and it's not about hee hee, ha ha, giggle and stuff like that. We have an internet in our body, a nervous system full of uh, neurons with axons and neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are, they convey messages to our body that we don't have to think about. And then we have a circulatory system which is like the freeway that moves stuff through our bodies. What we put in our body gets distributed all over. Once you put a substance in your body, whether it's food or otherwise or a feeling, it changes the way we think. It affects your judgment and inhibition right out the gate. There are four things that affect those neurotransmitters uh, in hierarchy. The first one is drugs, substances, and I'm including alcohol and nicotine and all those others. Drugs are at the top of the list on how they change the way we think. They go straight to the brain, and then we'll move into other other aspects of our body, our cardiovascular system, our gastrointestinal system, our lymphatic system, and our cognitive issues. Um, and the next one is sex. And the third one is food. And the fourth one is rock and roll. <laughs> and what I mean by rock and roll, there are physical activities that will change the way we feel about ourselves and get those neurotransmitters going. And one of them can be gambling, of course, the sex. It can be a variety of other physical activities, even um, uh, running and, and physical and physical workouts and things can change the way you feel, depending on which neurotransmitters are keyed and move through your brain. So it's not just a simple matter. Those things actually take place in our brain and affect the way we feel, the way we think, and what we do. It's all about the pleasure reward system that we have here and in the ventral tegmental area and and, uh, and, and the amygdala, what, what happens is our brain likes it and it says more, right? Have you guys ever sensed that? Had something to eat and your brain says, I gotta have another one of those, <laughs> right? Or, and that's exactly what happens. 
With regards to substances, after a while, the off button doesn't go on anymore. It doesn't go off anymore. It, it won't stop you. It, the, the drugs that will overtake our systems. And after a period of time, one hit isn't going to make you addicted. It's just going to make you feel good. But a successive amount of time, and what does it take? I don't know. It depends on you physiologically. And what it takes and how often you use that stuff in order to make yourself feel differently. And at some point, uh, let me say that hmm, I had my first drink of alcohol that I knew what I was doing as an altar boy when I was nine years old at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church after Mass. Then addiction, the older guys said, come here. And I thought they were going to kick my butt. You know, big guys, right of passage, beat up the little guys. And so I was looking at which one I was going to kick and which door I was going to fly through. And instead, they, op they opened the bottle of wine. Happened to be from San Antonio Winery. <laughs> here. Have a hit. And I became one of the fellas. There was a, 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 a sense of exception. Cariño in Spanish, you know. That in that circumstance, and it had a social nice effect with regard to me at that point. But I didn't drink alcoholically the rest of my life from age nine. It just had a, a good inroad with regard to me. I hated smoking, so I never did that. Um, I used to like go get cigarettes at the store on my mom's uh, account, and then I would sell them for money, right? <laughs> but, but the smoking uh, was not a part of what I was doing. And, but the alcohol, not until later, things in life happen. And we will do things to make ourselves feel better psychologically and emotionally. Um, I wasn't drinking. I got you know drunk a few times. And you throw up, and you say, I'll never do that again until the next time, right? And uh, that happened a couple times until something called the Vietnam War came up, and I was drafted in 1968. And I went through training at a time when it wasn't a popular issue. The streets had just been, uh, the fires were put up, put out in South Central and, and East LA. The skies were no longer orange. And then the, the issue of the war came up. Now, when I was a kid, my mom was a whack nurse in the Second World War. Okay, I was born in Fort Dix, Trent, New Jersey. I'm Scottish, Irish, Jewish, French, Spanish, Yaki. Okay, I'm confused. <laughs> and I was born in Fort Dix, Trent, New Jersey. I'm the only Mexican that I know that was born on the East Coast. Right? <laughs> My father was from Chicago. He's the Scottish Jewish, uh, an Irish guy that, that, uh, that met her during the World War. He was in the D-Day invasion and transportation. So he came back to Los Angeles. And uh, there were things in life that happened. She divorced him really young. I didn't see him after I was like five years old, and he died when I was seven. He died at age 39 as an alcoholic, right? Uh, I'm 67. I'm all, he was a baby when he died, right? So my mom's raising me. She's raising me like a drill sergeant, you know? And, and you know, poverty sucks. You're going to go to school. I want to be an artist. She says, no, they're all gay and they die before they get rich and I ain't waiting. Okay? <laughs> She's a very practical woman. She's a legal secretary, by the way. And then I said, well, I want to be a doctor. She says, no, that takes too long and I ain't waiting. I told you. <laughs> You're going to be a lawyer or die in the process. I mean, let me tell you. But there were things in our circumstances. I'm glad to my mother that she imposed that, the education thing. Well, when I got drafted, I wasn't all there with regard to that war. I thought it was a bad political decision, period. And the people they were sending there happened to be brown and black, right, that were in the field. And poor, poor white people that were being drafted, they needed cannon fodder. I knew that. And what I did know, though, was that if I didn't go, I would get a federal beef. And if I got a federal beef, I couldn't be a lawyer. I couldn't be anything, right? So I went June 6, 1969. An idiot in front of me hits a mine. And I get blown away. Um, my liver, my stomach, my left arm, my left leg by a booby trap that he set up. I was so mad at that guy. Four of us went down, and him. Uh, they had to take my rifle away from me because I was trying to do him harm because he was yelling for help and I was going to give it to him. But it changes you. And let me tell you, I can, I can say it with anger, but I was afraid. When I saw my life passing, I was afraid. That translated, that vulnerability, I didn't like it. I didn't, wasn't taught to be vulnerable by my mom. 
and it turned to anger and hatred. And I held that for years. And that's what motivated me. When I came back from the war, I didn't want to see you. So I went to Vietnam. I, I mean, I went to, yeah, I did that. I went, <laughs> I went to Spain. I bought a ticket at TWA. It was an eyeball. It was uh, from a painting by Goya of, of uh, uh, Don Quixote de la Mancha. It says, have you ever seen Spain? I said, no. So I bought a ticket and I left. I left the United States and I stayed in Spain in North Africa, right? And I came back only after the money ran out and I couldn't get in and some friends of mine enrolled me at Cal State Northridge. They wouldn't send me money so I had to come home. I only had a home ticket, right? But I spent the, all that time in Spain, North Africa, roaming around, doing whatever, having a good time. And I got back, I went to school, uh, graduated from Northridge with two BAs in uh, comparative English literature and Chicano studies, still very political. But I worked as a bail bondsman at night. I needed a job, and a friend of mine was working for the Maldonados over in East LA, across from the Third Street Station. What does that mean? That means that by day I was a college student, and at night I was in all the, the gangster bars from Marty's, Alarina, Whittier, to the Atkins. And the Atkins you didn't walk into unless you were packing, and I was packing at night. At a, I had a pager, you remember when they came out more roll? <laughs> it sounded like a, like, a, like a fire alarm when it went off. And when you put it on vibrate, you were going like this. <laughs> um, I was in a bar one day with this guy and he had a glass and he was going like this with some stuff. I'd been drinking, I'd drink every night. Then I'd go to, I'd go to work in the morning, go to school, and I'd have a quart of beer. They don't sell quarts anymore, I understand. Uh, and I'd drive to Northridge and I'd go to class and see I'd go to the bars and hang out with the bad guys at night and move on. This guy had this stuff and he went like this and I said, what's that? He says, cocaine, haven't you heard of it? This is the 70s, it's not addictive. If you can afford it, you can do it. You wanna try some? I said, sure. So I stayed not addicted for the next 22 years. <laughs> I had emotional and psychological problems, not issue. I've been diagnosed with PTSD from Vietnam, right? and some other circumstances. That helped me get through some of that stuff. All of those things that I did. You know, it's like being bipolar when, you, when you're in your uh, manic phase. A 40 ounce will make you feel good, right? If you're in your depressed state, a line of coke is gonna lift your, <laughs> elevate your mood. And so you self-medicate. That's what we do. We wanna make ourselves feel better. What resources do we have? We reach out to those things we have experience with and do until they capture us. There is no there was no knock on the door that said, Jimmy, if you don't stop using today, you will not be able to stop tomorrow. I don't know that I would have made the decision, but there was no warning. And I don't know what day it was that there was another knock on the door, I don't even know if I heard it, that said, this stuff ain't gonna work no more. And what happens after a while is you're no longer seeking that physiological, emotional, uh, psychological relief anymore. All you're trying to do is maintain levels within your body so you'll go through withdrawal. The discomfort of not having the level of drugs in your body to that. And that's all it's about. It's about maintaining that level forever and ever. Are you functional? Yeah, you can carry images to get caught, get caught yourself. It, it's, it was bad luck that I got three DUIs in one year. Right? Uh, what did I do, the first one? Uh, I was still going to court on the first one and when I got the third one. It was uh, April, October, no, October, April, and October in the early 80s. And the first one was fine. The second one, I did 10 days in Glendale, and I would order pizza for the cops and for the inmates there, and have my secretaries bring me work. And I, would, I was doing work out of the jail for 11 days. Later on, when I got sentenced on the third one, I had to do six months in the county jail. You know where HOJJ is? Up on top, my condo is up there. You can see the San Gabriel Mountains from there. And every night he stayed there for six months. What I would do is go in with sweats, pull my pants down, let them look at where nobody else has looked, and send me to my cell. In the morning I'd get out, I paid for work furlough, and I'd have somebody, my clients would drive me to work, right? Because I didn't have a driver's license. They'd drive me to work, I told them so that I could explain the case and go over things with them. <coughs> then after work, after the office, I'd have some baby pick me up, and we'd do a little no-tell time, some dinner, and then <laughs> back to my condo, and they dropped me off. <coughs> that went on for six months. I spent, you know, like Super Bowl Sunday, and 
Christmas and New Year's and all that stuff. Like that. And uh, that happened in 83. The last view I got was in 1990. And I hadn't been arrested for it. I didn't think I had a problem. I was just trying to get away with it. I was unlucky. You know, what those people, I deserve, I, I have status. I do things. I help people. What the hell's wrong? But then who helps me? I don't know. I didn't deal with the issue. I didn't know how to stop. Nowhere in all of that education I had was I taught how to stop or deal with the issues. They don't teach you. Was that on your curriculum at the colleges and schools you went to? They teach you that in law school? Only how to get them out of it, right? <laughs> what the elements are and what the defenses are, and that's it. Well, uh, eventually, uh, things went downhill fast. And in 1994, I was disbarred. And uh, you know why? I never bothered to show up. They sent the envelopes. I still have the sealed envelopes from the state bar. I was in my insanity. Ah, they're not going to do anything. <laughs> Guess what? They did. <laughs> and I went into treatment to hide and to figure out what the hell went wrong so I could check it out, get another certificate. I got a lot of certificates and diplomas, and so I could come back out and get back to business. Except that when I was there, I learned something different. That I had to learn a different style of living, and that's what was made available to me. Within our profession, we're double the percentage with regard to the population in terms of substance abuse, and that includes alcohol as well as drugs, right? That's where we are as a profession. We always have to be up front on top. There's a lot of stress and very little me time. Uh, has anything changed since 1982 when I first got here? <laughs> no, I see the cases, I see the, and generations of people. You know, of, of us helping people and becoming involved in that, we become codependent in their context. Who could help me then? Nobody. Nobody I knew, nobody I worked for, nobody I worked with had the capacity to teach me what to do. They didn't. They became part of that big river in Egypt, denial. You know, every time I said, I'm sorry, it was just asking for permission to do it again. Right? And that was it. And, and to move on. But I needed to learn something different. My family, my friends did not have the understanding and the learning to be able to do that. And they fell into hoping that things would change if they supported and loved me. And that was where I got it. Right? Oh, and for those of you that are interested, I spent a lot of time at the office. That's what I used to tell both my wives. Wife one, wife two. They get along t together. <laughs> Same jerk, different wife, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, there was this place I used to hang out. Was, I told him, I'm going to be at the office. On the weekends, I've got to be at the office. Where were you? I was at the office. In Lincoln Heights on North Broadway, there's a bar called The Office. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I did a lot of my work. Uh, I did have to be taught. I, became, I was addicted to alcohol and, and drugs. And uh, what happened was I had to be taught how to make a change, and I needed to be detox. I had to level out what was in my body and not do that. And the first 30 days was on lockdown in a place in Pasadena called Impact. And a friend of mine got me in there. I went for two weeks. He says, this guy's a fool. He probably won't last a week, but please tolerate him for a while. And I stayed about 30 days and things started to change. I didn't have anything to drink. I didn't have anything to do. And I was listening to stuff and going to meetings. And it was cognitive behavioral therapy about learning how to understand and make the changes in my life and my lifestyle and how to deal with my issues. And it was only 30 days. And you know what? <clears throat> I couldn't understand. I began to, a light started to go on. It's, I think I have a problem. <laughs> and so what happened is I called my wife and I said, I'm going to stay for another 30, another 60 days. They say I can stay 90 days here. She says, okay, good. This is wife too, right? The one that was the next nun that was a barmaid at the place I used to hit on the evening. Right? She worked in a Catholic school. Right. I married God's ex-wife. Okay. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Uh, and so uh, she said stay. And in the meantime, she was like, we lo I lost everything. The car, everything is gone. And she would take the bus from Elmani to school with her daughter and then back again by herself and manage that. And after 90 days, they said, you can stay another 90 days. We're going to give you money. You can be on staff. We'll give you $150 a month. I was making a hell of a lot more than that when I hit that place. But it wasn't about the money, it was about staying longer because I had to learn some things some more and I was peaked on what was happening. I understood that there was a reason I was there because I had a problem. And so at the, at the end of six months, I, I called my wife and said, I'm gonna stay another, 
90 days. She says, okay. So I stayed another 90 days. And then at the end of that six months, they offered me a job, but 